Good evening. I'm a Baptist preacher. If you don't talk back to me, I won't know you're here. Good evening. Good to see y'all. How about that film? Huh? My hometown, I'm representing the D with my hat here tonight. So forgive the lack of sartorial splendor as I exhibit a profound commitment to the land from which I emerged. Uh, this film was very provocative, very brilliant to me because it engaged a serious issue that continues to matter to us, and that is how we relate as citizens to a police force which is ostensibly committed to the protection and service of its communities, except communities of color are viciously targeted with unjust action. The great woman who made that film, and so many more, can we consider this part of a trilogy? Uh, Hurt Locker, Zero Dark Thirty, and now Detroit, among many other incredibly eclectic, genre-smashing films. She is at the height of her powers even yet, a woman of remarkable clarity and vision, a director of enormous fortitude, the only woman ever to win an Oscar, and given what's going on now, the miasma of the deconstruction of masculinity before our eyes. Patriarchy is on, is on a ventilator, <laughs> at least in part. That's just, the, that's just the external dress, and real patriarchy continues to be protected at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Every morning, every morning, excreting the feces of moral depravity before a nation in which he is turned into his psychic commode. I digress. Let's bring on one of the most remarkable, insightful, spirited, brilliant, uplifted, genius directors, Catherine Bigelow. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, a great writer, journalist, uh, to the manner born, old man did it, he's doing it well, brother Matt Taibbi, uh, with a brilliant new book, uh, I Can't Breathe. I mean, those words alone conjure the enormous gulf uh, between black people and the police forces that often, uh, in many ways, fail to serve us, and not only fail to serve us, but bring us to terminus uh, with a, a kind of efficiency that is scary. But he's written so many books of different uh, things, The Wealth Gap in America, and of course this book addressing the relationship between police and broader communities and the larger social issues, and writing brilliant political stuff for Rolling Stone magazine, Matt Taibbi. Thank you, sir. And last and certainly not least, a cultural icon, a remarkably prolific instigator, cultural creator, um, a remarkably gifted young man who continues to remain on the cutting edge. I mean, usually, especially in one of the professions he's involved in, uh, guys who are over 25 are like grandfathers. If that's the case, he's a great, 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 great granddaddy. Hey. <laughs> In the best sense of that word, a progenitor, a creative stylist. You see him every night with Jimmy Fallon doing this thing with the Roots, one of the greatest bands, not only hip hop bands, though that too, but one of the greatest bands in the last quarter century, an author of high intelligence, uh, and rhetorical ferocity, an eloquent, articulate, beautiful brother, Amir Thompson, better known as Questlove. Thank you, good night. <laughs> wow, that was amazing to hear. I never had so many great superlatives like I Thank mean, you. That should put you on payroll. I mean, man. <laughs> we you. have to have adjectives modifying nouns because we got a guy in office who knows 25 words. Big Lee, C. Dick Run, there's Jane. So, you. you know, Catherine Bigelow, this, um, 
every time I, I see this film, I'm just astonished at uh, so many facets, not the least of which is how you approach the subject. 50 years ago uh, in Detroit, Michigan, during an urban rebellion, an uprising uh, of the people because of a, a police injustice, uh, within that is an even more microscopic revelation of the tremendous tension between communities of color and police, between black people uh, and the cops. And you manage to go in there and excavate this story, bring it out so we can see it, and it's depressingly and amazingly relevant to what's going on right now. So what motivated you to engage that story and to reveal all of the different facets that, you, uh, that you've presented for us? Well, first of all, thank you for that introduction. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have to say exactly what, you know, that was the motivation, the fact that 50 years ago is also today and that nothing has changed. Mm -hmm. And it could potentially be tomorrow and until something happens. I feel like if art, if the purpose of art is to agitate for change, then, you know, that's what I need to do as a filmmaker and try to, I know it's painful, I know it's difficult, but the situation was painful and difficult and um, and you know we have to somehow create a paradigm shift mm -hmm. I think it's just and art can do that right I mean the, the, the one of the great things that has been consistent about you from the very beginning is the relationship uh, between art and aesthetics and politics on the other hand instead of avoiding them you just crash drive right into them uh, but it's a beautiful crash drive, right? Um, it's, it's a way of engaging the realities that we have to confront that a lot of us would rather sweep away. Gore Vidal said we live in the United States of amnesia. So a lot of, and this film doesn't let you become an amnesiac, right? You gotta know what was going on. So tell us about how you think art can really make a difference in how human beings view the crises of their culture, politically, socially, economically. Well, it's really a question of how, I know, this doesn't seem to be working. Um, uh, it's really a question of how, you know, what delivery system you use into the kind of cultural bloodstream. And I think film can be tremendously persuasive. And in, in this case, I suppose my intention was to humanize an unthinkable situation. And the story came to my attention right about the time of the Michael Brown, um, uh, not just the shooting, but when the decision not to indict the officer occurred. And so I found that to be a very emotional time. And, um, and then looking at the story and, and obvious, the obvious similarities and the acquittals that I couldn't quite understand and then trying to unpack it and humanize this so that we, you know, in the hope never to repeat it, of course. Mm -hmm. No, it's very, very, uh, I'll just hold it up here close. Uh, <laughs> no, it's extremely important. Um, Quest, you're, you're an artist of the first order. Um, you know very well about the relationship between art and politics, art and culture, yeah. because you come out of a, a genre to begin with of hip hop that was initially dismissed, it was passing, it's a fad, it ain't gonna last. Now it's, it's part of the DNA of the culture. What is the role and responsibility of the artist to think, talk, reflect on what's going on, and can a difference be made by the art we create? Um, I'll say that hip hop's initial uh, first wave of consciousness, so I guess you could say between 82's uh, The Message, uh, kind of ending with perhaps uh, maybe Public Enemy's Fear of a Black Planet in 1990. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was a, it was a good and a, an effective run. Uh, and it did wonders for my generation of hip hop coming up. Um, there's a line that Karis once said that uh, in the song You Must Learn, he says, you don't know that you ain't just a janitor because no one told you about Benjamin Banneker, mm -hmm. which, I mean, really rings true that a lot of the education that I got of our history came from hearing it first in uh, rap music and then me mm -hmm. doing the research later. But um, I think it's necessary. There was, there was a point, I believe, I, th I think the turning point 
I, I had falsely predicted uh, maybe in late 2002 that uh, that one of the benefits of having um, kind of a, a uh, this is when uh, Bush the second was about to take office, and I mm -hmm. said that, well, you know, one of the great benefits is that we're really going to have great art because we know like a lot of great protest music is going right. to come out and right. people are going to be conscious and and almost it, it was a, it was an about face, and I think that when uh, when Natalie Mines of the Dixie Chicks had spoken out against the war, right, and they lost their careers, yeah, everyone just. <laughs> I mean, it was such a, like, suddenly artists were aware that, oh, we have something to lose, mm -hmm. you know. It's, it's like, you know, I'm certain that Chuck D wasn't living in a, a, a Bentley or, you know, kind of this over-access right. hip-hop lifestyle that right. sort of came into in vogue, like, in the late 90s. So right. there really wasn't anything to lose. And, and now that we saw the sacrifice of, you know, it's one thing when it's like, you know, it's an urban artist or whatever, but it's a whole other thing when you see the, the, the pinnacle of what America stands for, right. especially in country music, like, At the heart. just get sacrificed like that. And right, so right. I took notice and I was like, yo, like, That's real. this isn't a joke. So um, hmm. for us, it's, it's kind of weird because we actually... For the roots, um, we kind of stuck to our guns and and went hard politically because I mean at the time we were living in Philadelphia, which right. is, was kind of doing Chicago numbers now as far as the murder rate back right. in uh, the early aughts, mm -hmm. and um, I definitely remember being shocked and rather offended that critics were kind of looking at us like, well, what do you guys have to complain about now? Like you know, Obama's right. in office and right. I was like, what do you guys know about oppression? Like, you know, the, right. <laughs> like I don't have cousins or next door neighbors or, you know, that sort of thing. The Colin Kaepernick deal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I guess, it, especially with the, the situation of this song uh, and seeing the movie, I really took it personal because, you know, the dramatics were a group I admired. Yeah. And, you know, there's a scene at that soda machine where he's sort of like, but officer, we're singers, like, right, right. which should hopefully have, have been a, a a shield or a protection, and it, and it wasn't. And right. you know, I hate to say this, but oftentimes, uh, that has to be used. I have to use that, um, and kind of remind people. Wow, yeah, because there's always one second where it's like, aren't you? Yeah, right. Jimmy Kimmel, right? And <laughs> yes, sir, I am on Jimmy. <laughs> Like that sort of thing. I don't care what Jimmy he says. It could, <laughs> it could have been Jen Neighbors, but just Shazam. just last week. And you know the thing. The thing is, like, even on my my social media, um, I kind of shy away from those personal issues. Like, I kind of like to keep my social media about music and yeah. silly things, like my favorite cereal or some cartoon I liked as a kid or Soul right. Train. But um, yeah, just last week, man, I got I got degraded hard. Like, you could tell the difference between, like, well, I never had a traffic violation. Right. Usually, my pullovers is of the, well, what do we have here sort of variety. Right. And then that's what happened. It's right. like I, I often do DJ gigs in Brooklyn, and it's just always a, a roll of the dice. And, mm -hmm. you know, you're either going to get pulled over because of sobriety check, which is like, okay, well, it's everybody going through this. Right. And, you know, if it's like if it's in Dumbo or some sort of isolated place yeah. and they get a visual of like mm -hmm. me and the car that, you know, I have and right. I, I took a risk and I had that situation and it wasn't pleasant at all. Yeah. And it was like one false move. And like I saw their hands on the trigger. Right. Like and I'm just. It, wow. There's no. Yeah. There's no feeling in the world where it's like, where you're just watching his index finger yeah. in his pocket mm -hmm. as he's waving a flashlight. And this was last Tuesday. Wow. And so, <laughs> yeah. No, it, it, ha no, it happens no a amnesty. lot. So, yeah. um, well, I thought it was necessary. Yeah, to no, speak that's, out. That's, that's extremely, extremely powerful. 
and with your usual eloquence, you know, you, you make us understand something that's so abstract for so many people, which is why film is so important, right? I mean, thinking about that, you know, Sister Natalie, I think about then how brave Kanye was. You know, the, the older Kanye, the one we hunger for and nostalgia for. Yeah, the every man Kanye. Yeah, the, yeah, The right. Springsteen Kanye. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, he, yeah. Was every, he was every man. Like, I mean, that, he, that, was, he, that was sort right? of the thing. George, George Bush doesn't care for black people. I mean, he just, that, those words just put Kanye between AC and BC. You know, it's after and then before that. And, you know, to challenge the culture uh, in a way you're speaking about, uh, and rest in peace to Mel Tillis just died, says so country music. I'm a big country music fan. Yeah. Um, so, Matt, given what, what um, Quest just said, the, he, 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 one of the most globally recognized artists of our time. You can't get more iconic with that pick and that fro and that jocular, beautiful, giving, loving spirit. And yet, he is afraid when he sees the hand twitch and move toward the gun because at that level, there is no artistic amnesty. There is no enclave of civility that will mitigate the, the possibility of that violence. And if it's true for him, and he's from Philly, Meek Mill and so on, we know about the justice system, even more so for Eric Garner, uh, a man who on film, you know, uh, said I can't breathe. And you, you know, if they say journalism is the first uh, blush of history, the first draft of history, uh, your book, uh, is more, not to this journalism uh, which we are so hungry for in this era of post-factual, you know, post-empirical uh, fake news. Um, it's good to have journalism back and vibrant and so on, but this book is really a deep dive into some serious issues. And the, the, one of the con confounding things, and I want you to help us understand this, Catherine Bigelow, you know, an amazing non-pareil filmmaker, so she can present a, a true live story, but through a fictional means of a film, right? You've got videotape right. on a smartphone. Now everybody becomes a critic, mise-en-scene, and this is the end, and this is, you didn't see what happened at the beginning. Now everybody's you know, gonna be Godard or something, right, and figure it out. But you got all of these films, but they end up becoming snuff films because they don't have the moral satisfaction of relieving the person who dies by delivering justice they're seen as yet more evidence that cops will never be held to account. Tell us about the visualization through either what, both through what Catherine Bigelow did on that screen and what you wrote about uh, in your very affecting book about Eric Garner, in part. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that's um, the problem with uh, the Twitter age mm -hmm. uh, is that they're beginning with Eric Garner, really, and then continuing on with Michael Brown and Freddie Gray and all these cases, Sandra Bland, um, Laquan McDonald later. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody's seen the, the films a million times, um, but the stories become sort of brief emotional uh, connections that people have on the internet, but they mm -hmm. don't really think, um, they're not invited to think beyond uh, the, those scenes and to consider the larger context uh, in which these things take place. Mm -hmm. So for instance, with the Garner case, and, uh, and also to an extent with the Algiers case, mm. uh, there people could look at it and say, this is a case of one psychopathic cop mm. who, if we did a little bit better at removing these people, would, uh, you know, these things wouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. Whereas in reality, if you, if you watch your movie, uh, and if you pay attention to what happened in the Garner case, both, um, it's the surrounding ecosystem that makes these people possible. It's the, mm. it's the EMTs who don't do anything uh, and let the bodies sit there for too long. It's the National Guard that, that doesn't, inter doesn't intervene. It's the state police who don't intervene. Right. Uh, it's the judges who don't do anything later. It's the detective who knows the, the guy's a psychopath beforehand and lets him go back out in the street. That mm -hmm. also happened in the Garner case. Right. Uh, this is somebody right. who had 14 complaints against him. Mm. Um, and so as, as much attention as these videos have brought to the issue, uh, they've also sort of narrowed our focus. 
where we're not paying attention to the fact that this is a larger systemic bureaucratic issue that in, in, in large part is also brought, up, brought about by voters. I mean, a lot, a lot of us upscale white voters in cities like New York are voting for policies that are more aggressive, more interventionist, and are creating uh, this, this kind of stuff. And, and, um, and so it's, it, there's a disconnect there, I think, yeah. just between, yeah. You think now that Trump is treating everybody like black in the nation, we'll get it? Okay, don't <laughs> answer. Because uh, that's partly what's going on, right? That Trump has made niggas out of everybody. <laughs> and men have turned other men into, right? Right, the mistreatment of women, right? Sexism and racism converge to paint an ugly picture of who we are as a nation. So, Catherine, in your film, you, uh, given what Matt just said, tell us about then the challenge. I mean, you, I, I think one of the ways you do aesthetically, you approach this film with your, your style of editing and bringing us, I mean, we're on the edge of our seats because we're literally right there with the movement. And, but, but you don't give us any grace, right? You don't, you don't let us escape because then the camera is dragging us right into the center of the, the movement. So we're nervous because we don't have any refuge. Um, that's not just an emotional uh, reality. That's something that you provoke in terms of your stylistic approach to the editors and your team. But it's making a bigger philosophical point that unless we get involved, unless we feel that's our child, that's our fellow citizen, that's, that's us, that can happen to us, uh, we'll just write it off as some epiphenomenal thing that is in passing, as opposed to, as Matt just said, a reflection of a deeply, a deeply rooted problem. Well, sadly, in the case of the Algiers, or certainly in Eric Garner, and these cases we're discussing, history doesn't allow or offer refuge. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't exist. So, right. you know, it is, it's a grim story. It's, yeah. it's a grim yeah. series of events. And so, as difficult as it was to do the research on this, it was also very difficult, of course. It, I know it's difficult to watch. It was difficult to shoot. But I have to say, between the cast and the crew, we all felt a shared sense of purpose, of mm -hmm. this story needs to be told as accurately and as authentically as possible, yet still be a movie and not a documentary. Right. But, um, but part of that telling, what comes with that is, is to try to, like you say, make it experiential, put mm -hmm. you in that hallway, put you in, in, in that motel and offer again to you know to humanize a situation that's pretty much unthinkable for mm -hmm. for many people and um sadly tragically and you know uh, hopefully in that is you know is that potentially cathartic i mean i i i guess i wonder if art can be cathartic if mm -hmm. if music can be cathartic if journalism can be cathartic i mean what other per what other means do we have mm -hmm. to I don't know to right. um, yeah yeah provoke to make a better to provoke to make a yeah. better social order. I, I mean right. Well, you know, you've dealt with and before I weigh in on this issue because you know I'm pretty passionate about it. I'm gonna let you weigh in on it as a white woman making this film. I know a lot of people. You know, I'm from Detroit. They were like, "Man, for real? Like, okay, but yeah, I know she won an Oscar, but you know." I'm just saying she ain't a sister, but she, you know. <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, she is, she light-skinned. But what I said, <laughs> but <laughs> she, she definitely one of us. So, but as a white woman, right? And, and this is a perilous and fraught territory, because it could be Lena Dunham. <laughs> sorry, wow. sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, hipster racist, I mean, wow, that's just a beautiful phrase, hipster racism, I gotta, I gotta teach that in class. So, you know, you, 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 you're, you're liberal, but then all that other crap comes in. It's not quarantine to Trump. Oh my God, it's metastasized across the body politic, and here is the tumor in Liberalville. But you, as a brave, courageous, insightful, brilliant white woman, went to the heart of this matter and struggled with this in a way that's so powerful. And let me, let me give this as a brief back, background. I'm old enough to remember, you know, forget whether you are a white woman. Spike Lee, a lot of people didn't think, should be making the Malcolm X film, right? And people forget that now because it's one of the great biopics ever made. 
It's a remarkable film, but Leroy Jones, then Amiri Baraka, they were coming for his yeah. neck. You remember that quest? They, they were, you were a kid, but they were coming, they were coming at his neck and saying, oh no, you don't have the pedigree, you're a bourgeois Negro, you're capitulating to the dominant you know, liberal mainstream and film community and you won't get it right. So tell us about that pressure um, and how you handled it and what you think about a white, prominent, only Oscar winning female director addressing a, a persistent racial problem. Well, I um, <laughs> only. Thing. She'll speak for white America right now. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> Welcome to our world. That's what we do. <laughs> um, no, that was. Mm. I had to do a lot of soul searching, mm. and I have to say that my first thought was, "Am I the right person to make this movie?" Absolutely not. Mm. On the other hand, it's been sitting dormant for 50 years mm. and all these other events are happening it might be worthwhile to expose this event and realize that oh that was 50 years ago certainly we've changed mm -hmm. we haven't right so i suppose i obviously i decided to make the movie in spite of the fact that i you know did not feel like I was the perfect person to make mm. it. On the other hand, I think, I think it's incumbent on the white community to, when I say change, I'm talking about the white community. Mm -hmm. It's like if you use rape as an analogy, it's not the rapist that, um, sorry, it's not the person who's been raped that needs to make the social change. Right. It's the perpetrator. That's so right. I think that it's, Basically speaking to the white community, and then it goes back to another conversation about whose story is whose, and, mm -hmm. and you right. know. If I could, no, if I could address that yeah, briefly, too, because yeah. I obviously had the same problem. I was going to uh, ask you, Matt. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're taking my thunder, Matt, but go uh, ahead. Yeah. Matt, you're a white guy, I think. Another light-skinned black man. Right. But, uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, tell us about that. Because, see, what's at stake there, in particular in both of your genres, is the notion, well, but black people can't really get the funding and the resource to be able to do that, so we don't even, quote, own our stories. Now, of course, that's, th there's undeniable truth to that statement. Sure. But see, I would happen to, I think you were the perfect person to make that film. N nobody's an ideal, but you're certainly a perfect person because of your bona fides and your credentials and what you bring. But tell us about that struggle. Sure, I mean, I, I, I went through exactly the same questions. Am I the right person to tell this story? Uh, there were elements, to, as much as I tried to, d to dig into what Eric Garner was like and what his life was all about, and as many people as I interviewed, I realized that there were, there were elements to his experience that I was never going to be able to connect with and that that was going to be a flaw in the book. But, um, but this is not just a story about Eric Garner's experience. It's a story about white America. Right. It's a story about uh, people like George Kelling, who created the Broken Windows program. Right. It's a story about people like Bill Bratton. It's a story about people like Bill de yeah. Blasio uh, and the city and the bureaucracy that he created. And you know, to a to a degree, I think you know, it's for white artists, for 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 white journalists. You know, I think we have to start owning responsibility to, to start digging into these stories and facing them a, right. a little bit. I mean, I, I, the, the idea that we shouldn't go into this territory, I, 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 I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure whether that's, that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I, but I gotcha. think that there's an element to the story that we also have a responsibility to tell. Yeah, great point. And before we open up to the audience, I got to get Quest back in one more time, sure. because you're known as one of the most eclectic artists ever. I mean, you're, the range of your crates it's crazy, right? What you dig into, the sounds you create, the sonic architecture that you do. Mm -hmm. So at that level, um, you know, talk to us then about, and I'm thinking about Beyonce's and Eminem's recent song, which is, which is jarring, which is, which is searing uh, in a beautiful way, and the combination of their geniuses producing that. At, at, at what level um, does it make a difference that that you're a person of color or a quote minority um, to produce that art and at what level is it just as important or equally compelling to, to address the issues that not only black people but white people, not only brown and red and yellow people but white people have to contend with as well? 
Okay, so specifically for the song that we did for the film, right? Um, which you know, all those things that you mentioned, the idea of a snuff film, like there's no relief in the film whatsoever. Right. Um, I mean, I was up till five a.m. and I don't know why I was just I was so mad and angry, yeah. and I didn't know which way to approach this song. And I got down to the bare bones of it. And my first thing was like, okay, well, who do I want to speak to? Um, especially, you know, the time when uh, the song presented itself. We were in our third month of this, uh, of this, about to say coup d'etat um, <laughs> of this administration. <laughs> this hunter. Yeah, and so, you know, slowly I noticed that, I mean, I'm not saying it's a silver lining, but one of the small sliver, sliver, sliver lining of, of, <laughs> of lessons that I felt that America was learning, or at least that I was observing America learn, was the fact that they might that the rest of the world or the rest of America might slowly realize what life is like for minorities on the daily. Right. And, but there was one specific group of people I wanted to appeal to. And it's those people that have something to lose. Mm. You know, people that have to leave their comfort zone. Mm. Like I have, I, I, I know a group of white people that quote, know better, mm -hmm. that, know that something is wrong, that no, you know, and don't want to rock the boat, don't want to hurt people's feelings. And, mm -hmm. you know, when you kind of have that, that luxury of turning the other way and not necessarily have to deal with the problem. I mean, right. that's, right. that's a great luxury to have. You know, yeah. unfortunately, even in my, quote, privileged position, like, right. I'm, as long as I have family and other friends, like, no matter what my monetary situation is or my status or whatever, like, you know, I'm still talking to these people on the daily. I'm still on Facebook. I'm still, right. you know, some aunt's calling about bailing out some, you know what I mean? That right, sort right, of thing. Right. Um, so for me, I wanted to create a song that really humanizes the situation. And, you know, the first was like, okay, well, let's do a fight the power. Let's just do the angriest, you know, we're not going to take it anymore. And then I thought, okay, well, let's do a protest anthem that's always going to be pretty. But then I just thought, no, like, really, we need to show all the ranges of emotion. For, so for me, I told her, it's good, you know, this is not going to be an Oscar-friendly song. Uh, this is going to be an eight-minute emotional exercise. It's almost therapy. Mm -hmm. And we need to show all range of emotions. Like, Blau starts off singing, like, Beautiful. Eddie Kendricks, very yeah. soft and, oh, yeah. and and but at the end he's just seething with rage. Yeah, yeah. That's that's what I wanted to mm -hmm. bring out a slow emotional whirlwind that shows all range of emotions in eight minutes. Yeah. And well, really humanize the pain. So you did it. I mean brilliantly so. Just brilliantly. Thank you. Um we're gonna open up uh thank you. That's right, give him love. <laughs> Officer. Over there, you good, my man? I just want to make sure my officer back there is good. You good? Thank you, sir. <laughs> Keep that real. Um, anybody uh, have a question for uh, Miss Bigelow or Brother Matt and Brother Quest? Anybody got a question out there? Right over here. Yes, sir. Can we have a microphone? I think we have a microphone. Oprah, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was just going to ask about um, casting, like, the main cop. Like, if you had any kind of resistance from actors or anything to play the role, because I feel like now if I see that actor, like, walking down the street on Broadway, knowing Scary he's the actor, hell. I'm yeah. going to, like, sneer. Like, he's this terrible person. He's so. such a sweet guy. He's too. the nicest guy ever. <laughs> oh, my God. He still scares me when I see him. <laughs> Simply the night, he's the most opposite of that person yeah, that is. you could ever imagine. And it pained him, I think, quite a lot to actually do that performance but on the other hand he I mean he was so in my opinion he was just brilliant in, mm -hmm. in it and he you know he really I, I suppose um, 
was hungry for that challenge. He's a young, really talented actor. Mm -hmm. And no, nobody, um, nobody like thought it would, nobody thought not to try to audition. I mean, we had mm -hmm. a lot of options and too many wonderful, wonderful options. And, um, and I like really specifically like working with emerging mm -hmm. talent. And so, um, so there were a lot of, a lot of options. But um, Will Poulter is just, I think, a, you know, a real artist. Yeah, killing that accent too, right? Because he's from. Uh, he's he's British. Yeah, you couldn't. I, I and figured. You, yeah. And he stayed in accent. He stayed in that accent day and night, on and off the set. And in fact, not till not till we wrapped did he go back into his original <laughs> voice, and people were like, "What? Who are you?" You know, it was. Get on the ground now. Wait, wait. <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> anyway, that was, that was kind of amazing. But the real officers were that young. I, mm -hmm. I believe Kraus, or the, Kraus yeah. is a composite, but mm -hmm. were, was in the sort of 22, 23, 24 range. So part of, you know, part of it is their age. There was no sergeant for oversight. And I don't know, would that have changed anything? I'm not so sure. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am, in the back. Hold on, we'll bring the mic to you. Uh, how come it wasn't filmed, the, the uh, show wasn't filmed in Detroit? It, Sorry? The show, where was it filmed? It said Massachusetts, but yeah. why wasn't it filmed in Detroit? Because about a year ago they, they disbanded their incentives program, and we did shoot uh, like about a week there, but Massachusetts ha has a 25% above and below the line rebate, and that was a significant amount of money to save. So financially, we couldn't shoot all of it in Detroit. As We actually located the whole film, hoping that we were going to be able to get the incentives back, but no, in fact, they gave them what, what was left, they gave to Transformers, and that was it. Yeah. I know. I, I was yeah, like, what? Yeah, be mad. <laughs> but yeah, listen. And look what happened in that. Okay. Um, Massachusetts was a, was a good host, but we really wanted to shoot it in, in Detroit. Mm hmm. Great question. Yes, sir. Is it a man? Yeah. Down here? Front? Uh, hi, Catherine. Hi. Um, I was just curious with a film like this, which is um, it's so relevant and, and emotionally and politically charged. Um, did that change the way you worked uh, with your cast? I was thinking particularly, um, I was thinking about how many of these actors would be bringing their own personal uh, experience to the work. Um, and like in the way that Quest spoke about his, some of his experiences as well, did, did you feel that like on the set? Um, and did that change the way you worked on this film at all? Well, it's a really good question. I think it was, um, again, it was a very emotionally charged production because of the material. And I was very sensitive to everybody's stamina and thresholds of how they could, you know, deal with this. And everybody brought to it their own life experience, though. And it was, it was very varied. I mean, Algae is somebody so young and, um, you know, I was really... I don't know, I suppose, he'd, I'd asked him that, and he'd led a really charmed life. I mean, he felt very blessed to just be able to audition for that part. And, and yet, it just is a testament to his extraordinary talent that he was able to bring to it the pain and the anguish that was necessary for the role. So I think everybody arrived at, you know, at production with their own, both life experience and or what they were able to bring to it creatively. Mm -hmm. Great. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am, in the middle. Oh. We'll get you next, ma'am. The other middle. Oh, the other, I, I didn't know. That's okay. Oh, okay. Oh, I was in the, oh, yeah. um, Anyway, I'm really curious about the, um, the security guard and whether that if that was um, a real life character or composite and also just sort of what to make of him. I mean, is he, the kids in the street called him Uncle Tom and 
I'm wondering, though, if he actually plays the role of what Quest was talking about. Is this happening? Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. No. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you know, of whether he's actually there to function as the person who knows that something wrong is going on, but ultimately mm -hmm. is just filled with shame because he wasn't able to speak to that. Mm -hmm. Well, that's um, Melvin Dismukes is the name of the real person. And in fact, when I met him, I was with um, Michael Dyson and we had lunch with him and it was a very painful, um, very painful retelling of that of that night mm. beat by beat mm. by beat for him it was extremely painful and it was very very authentic to his telling of that night and he really found himself caught in a way between two worlds and i often think of um he's sort of in the in a little bit in the audience position not he's 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 a participant He's a viewer and yet incapable of doing anything about it. He can't really, it's such a fragile and fraught situation that, you know, to tip it one way or the other could be catastrophic. And he knew that. And, and yes, it was as, as accurate a rendition of his telling of that night as we were capable of making. Yes, that was yes we had two other like ladies. Yeah, yeah, the lady there. in the middle. Yeah. And then the other lady in the middle. Okay. <laughs> Ladies' night. <laughs> Two off for each other. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about that prologue. Um, you know, because it was really striking. At first, I wasn't sure I was in the right movie. Um, <laughs> and, and, and I was really drawn in by it, you know, because I wasn't expecting it. Um, and, but then when the, when the movie proper started, it, it just felt so aesthetically different from the rest of the film, and it was obviously such a deliberate choice. I wondered if you could sort of talk about how you arrived at that a little bit. Well, what was important to me was providing a context for the rebellion, and it was very important that this particular, the illegal drinking establishment, which was um, uh, given the nickname of Blind Pig, they were all called Blind Pigs, but um, that this rebellion wasn't a result of suddenly a drinking establishment was shut down. This right. was something that was years and years and years in the making. And the prologue is comprised of these paintings by a phenomenal African-American artist named Jacob Lawrence. And he painted the Great Migration. So it just gives you a sense of, um, it gives you a sense of context and background that that actually began, I mean, it also began, of course, earlier than the 1910, as mm -hmm. it as shown in the movie, but that gives you a sense of the movement or the exodus from the south to the north and the pursuit of jobs and the promise of equal rights, and which were not met, and the, con the compression of um, the group of people in the, in the city, and how the police force, police force was known for their aggression. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway, so it provided context and he did an extraordinary series of paintings, again called The, the Great Migration. He was only 23 when he painted them. Mm -hmm. And they're on view both in the Phillips Collection, collection mm -hmm. in DC and at the Museum of Modern Art here. Mm -hmm. So um, you can see them, but it's a, it's a beautiful body of work that I mm -hmm. thought provided a good backdrop so you'd have an understanding that there's an anger. If you're angry enough to burn your own house down, what does that come from? That was what was important to me, that you really truly understand mm -hmm. that anger and the pal that it be palpable. And, and it's years and decades in the making. Mm -hmm. Powerful. The woman in the middle, I think. Did we, did we lose her? Another one. Another one. <laughs> Okay. They're giving Stand us up, people. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting the hook right here. So how many questions do we have left? How many? One? Just one? No, I mean, how many? Where, where's the person giving me the signal? Two more? All right. We got three more. We have four. Four? Going four, one going once. Five? Five more? Okay. No. If y'all make them very brief, because I see three or four, and I see the brother in the back, you know, we got to represent. Uh, just <laughs> very, very brief questions, and then we'll have brief responses. All right? So go. 
Jeopardy. Yes. Uh huh. Um, as I was watching the movie, though, I, I couldn't help but to think, why couldn't they just say it wasn't a real gun? Would that do they know that that wouldn't have done anything, or they that that just uh, mm -hmm. give them the satisfaction? Thank you. I know that you know probably gotcha. that's not an answer, but uh, that that you might not know, but maybe you might. Okay. Have. Thank you. That. Great point. Somebody else has to. Yeah, I know. I mean, we discussed that a lot on the set, but um, unfortunately, no one did mention that there was a gun. And because that could go one of two ways. You know, it could be really, really bad, or it could be okay and exonerate them, but it didn't, you know, there was no one wanted to take, or I can only assume that that risk was too great to take. Can I say this very briefly, too? It is to presuppose that the cops were going to treat those people like human beings. Yeah. And there was no evidence for that. So to say that, oh, no, there was just a fake gun. Right. I mean, right? To disbelieve that story is a reflection of di the disbelief in black humanity. And, and I think that was very powerful. Uh, mm. Thank you. And the gun was never found, ever. Right. Could, I, could I also add one really yeah. quick thing? Right. Um, like, in almost all of these uh, brutality cases, um, if you listen to the, the banter on conservative radio, the, the question almost always is, if why didn't just, he just go along? Why, uh, why, why, did, why didn't they just right. uh, submit? Why did Eric Garner not just get in the car? Uh, and and the, the problem with that question often is, is that it's a problem of perception because uh, it's exactly as you're saying, it, pre it presupposes that it would have, would have made a difference. Uh, and right. you know, the, 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 the dominant the, uh, factor in all these situations is that it's already gone horribly wrong That's right. by that point. Uh, That's and right. there's really nothing that could be done. Yeah, great point. You want to jump in, Quest, right quick? You want a piece of that? It's, you were saying what I was thinking. Okay, cool. It's always, well, I call it the Price is Right syndrome. Right. It's like when you're watching the Price is Right, like you know that turtle wax is eighteen ninety five <laughs> when you're in the comfort of your home. <laughs> But there's a different type of pressure yeah. when you're in the situation. Of the, you're not thinking in your right mind at all. Right. Like right. when you're in that situation. Exactly. That I do know. And can I tell you this right quick? This is one of a personal story. I was uh, in Detroit being accosted by the police, the big four. They accused us of stealing our own car. I was 17. My brother was 18. His friend's 18. Evidence, empirical, which means that which, which can be verified or falsified through the senses, common sense. I tell the officer, I'm extracting the evidence that we have not stolen the car from my wallet. I reach for it. He hits me with the butt of his gun, knocks me down, beats my man Jones down. My brother didn't. I said, you must have been a snitch because they didn't touch you. And he said, nigga, if you move again, I'll put a fucking bullet through your head. Well, I did the right thing. I'm showing that I have a license and a registration. So I, I found the gun. But it presupposes that what's at stake is a piece of evidence. It's not. My life is at stake. The fact that I'm there, why do you have that kind of car? Why are you in this neighborhood? Why do you do what you do? So, so they're trying to solve philosophical conundrums through, through intimate gestures of interaction with people that often are lethal. That's why it's so hard for so many white people or people outside that you, you must have done something. You, you, you had to have raised your voice. And all these snuff films we see, you obey, get shot. Don't obey, get shot. Talk back to the cops, get shot. Don't talk back to the cops, get shot. Officer, I have a gun. How, how much more clear do you need to be than this? Philando Castile, Minnesota. Oh, officer, I just want to let you know, I have a gun, it's legal. Seven seconds later, he's dead. He's shot. So the question is not, why is it that they didn't say they had a gun? They understood at the moment of interaction as Quest Love understood that that itchy finger could be provoked for no good reason, but subsequent to my death, every good reason will be found to protect those who have killed me. So I didn't want to go off on that, but I, I just think that that does make a difference there. Yes, back to our regularly scheduled program. All right, who else? Don't, don't, don't cheat. Did, did we, if we called on you one of the four, were you one of the four in the middle here? Where are you? Come on, where are you? Where's your lottery number? Show me. Okay, yeah. Wow, it's... It's hard to ask this question after all that, but um, I kind of wanted to talk about the visual grammar. Um, it was so great. I mean, I kind of want to know what some of the conversations, I guess, that you had with Barry Aykroyd 
And because a lot of it felt like you watched a lot of archival footage and that, I mean, I'm almost saying the obvious, it kind of like lent the, the grammar there. Mm. Um, oh, can you talk a little you. bit about that? Great point, great point. Well, um, yeah, and the archival footage that we watched also found its way into the movie because it was just, it was mesmerizing, you know, to look at and then to try to integrate that as best we could. We used... Um, Hold on, hold on. No, no, oh. Okay, sorry. <laughs> we used uh, the Alexa Mini, but what was interesting is like two, maybe weeks before we began the production, they created an adapter where we could use a vintage lens with the um, very, obviously, very contemporary camera. And so that created this kind of slight degradation of the frame. And, and, and that was, and Barry and I did Hurt Locker together. And so we just, we finished each other's sentences. And I, I, I just, I love working with him. We keep it very, we move very, very quickly. It's very brisk, which was also very helpful for the cast in telling the story. But he tends to light large uh, areas, and then we can just work very fluidly through page, 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 page. We can just keep going. And so I think that provides a kind of, um, I don't know, not just attention, but the sense of the you are there sense, because you are there, the camera's there. And everything is constantly in motion, just like life. And it's messy in that, you know, it's not like perfectly blocked or it doesn't feel mechanical or overly rehearsed. I, I tend to not rehearse. I like, you know, you try to choose well with your casting and then let it unfold. All right. What do I what? I'm so sorry. Bypass yeah. rehearsal. Okay. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. What I do is I do a lot of improv in the audition process. So, uh, like for instance, Algie, I, we had, uh, we had many, many beautiful, gorgeous, fabulous actors, and um, I had one of the police officers, actually the character playing, who plays Flynn, Ben O'Toole, come in and put them all against the wall. They weren't prepared for that. They didn't know what was going to happen. But it was, I mean, it wasn't like hurtful or. And, um, and then I went up to Algie, you know, they don't know what's gonna happen to them, and I said, sing Amazing Grace. And he did, very, I, I whispered to him, and he began to sing, and then they all started to sing. I mean, it was just, mm -hmm. it was a moment, and, and the character playing Ben O'Toole, he just started to cry. <laughs> I mean, the, <laughs> sorry, the uh, character who's gonna play the police officer. I mean, it was a very, mm -hmm. so it's a, I like to see how people will respond in an improvisational way, mm. and it was, um, anyway, so that's what provides context for me to mm -hmm. um, do it on the set. Beautiful. All right, two more that we had. Oh, actually, I think that's all we have time for tonight. There was a, well, I promised a brother up top. I gotta get a black man some Yeah, we can get one there. more question. Yeah, yeah, get a brother some. Get a drummer some. Yes, yes. sir. Well, oh, they're, gonna, they're gonna come up with the mic. Thank you. <laughs> so um, I would say I do appreciate the film. Um, very, very often, you know, um, if I look back, I, I think of a film, The Blue Shield, and I think about the context between officers and, and balance like that. Then I think of a time to kill, and I think, well, you know, hey, if uh, if you can think about this uh, person that we're prosecuting, and if there was a person that looks like your family member, and um, a couple questions were, was asked, and was like, well you know, is any part, part of this fiction. It just so often, I guess, my pain, your art. What, my pain, your art, right? And it's for art, artists. Hold the microphone up a little bit. So yeah, we my pain, your art. So what mm -hmm. happens with that a lot of times is that everything that happened in that film, I could depict. I'm from Harlem, USA, you know? Um, I'm also the older cousin of Ramali Graham. So I can also sit there and see how I come from a long line of officers, but on the other side, I also have a cousin that was killed by officers. And then when I see a film like this, I just wonder what, what do you hope is the takeaway that the audience doesn't feel that this is just a loop or this is something like on a day to day, this is a challenge that we have of your fellow person. You know, the inside of my hand doesn't look like the outside of my hand, but it's still my hand. So what do, what do you hope for at this point? Mm. Thank you. Well, I, um, I think that um, people can learn from one another and that people can change. And so my, my hope is that, in a way, the film is like two acts of a three-part, a three-act structure. It gives you as much information as I can possibly provide 
given that it's a historical piece, given it's a movie and not a documentary, it's as respectful to the facts as we were capable of doing, given what we knew and all the court records and the FOIA, the Freedom of Information requests that we made. But at the same time, I, I, I suppose as a filmmaker, I think the third act rests with the audience. And that if, if we have the capacity to think, we have the capacity to change. And so that's sort of, I feel like, the third act is in all of our hands. Mm -hmm. All right. That's Questlove, Matt Taibbi, Michael Eric Dyson, and the great Catherine Bigelow. Oscar nomination. <laughs> <laughs>